the power of letting this body be a portal is that there's a shift in our sense of who we are. And rather than being a kind of egoic self that is stealing against pain, controlling pain, fighting pain, running away from pain, we become that oceanness, that presence that includes all the waves of aliveness, includes them all, and yet is not defined by them, is not fighting them, is not limited to them. So just to go back to the beginning here, we all have, it's universal, the conditioning to pull away from unpleasantness, every one of us. Depending on our background, we might be locked into more dissociation or less. It's not our fault, just what happened. And our, system, our nervous system learned how to dissociate. The culture exacerbates it. We're in a culture where there's really severed belonging. So we don't belong to our bodies, we don't sense a belonging to the earth body. And what happens when we don't feel our belonging is we don't bring care to this being here and we don't bring care to our enlarged being, the earth. We violate the earth. If we felt our belonging to the earth, if we felt that the earth is our larger living body, we couldn't do what we do to this earth, we couldn't let it happen. Does that resonate for you? Yeah. D. H. Lawrence, ahead of his time, of course, describes, you know, he says, we have been living from our little needs and we've made the mistake and we've lost touch with our deeper needs as a kind of madness. He says, it's a question of relationship. We need to get back into relation, vivid and nourishing relation to the cosmos and the universe. He said, the truth is we're perishing for lack of fulfillment of our greater needs. We're cut off from the great sources of our inward nourishment and renewal, sources that flow eternally in the universe. Vitally, the human race is dying. It is like a great uprooted tree with its roots in the air. We must plant ourselves again in the universe. I think that's so powerful, this great uprooted tree and the roots in the air. It's like like we're going around these egoic selves, like we don't belong to this living world. We need to replant ourselves in the universe. So the last piece of tonight, do a little time check, is really what happens when we begin to really dedicate ourselves to replanting ourselves in the universe, when we dedicate ourselves to waking up out of this trance of thought and honor and cherish and inhabit this living body. When even though the weather's difficult, we find our ways to experience the waves fully and sense our oceanness. What happens? What are the blessings and gifts that come in our life when we really do this path of embodied spirit? And um, the three that I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on in closing, the three gifts that I really sense come from this portal of embodied awareness are aliveness, love, and a deep wisdom. The aliveness, so many people that come to uh, a week-long retreat, after coming back again and again to the body, report the same thing, which is their senses become magically enlivened so that the colors are exquisite and the sounds are like a, a symphony and this natural world becomes like pure mojo, just magically beautiful. There's this appreciation that's so big. I know the, I love the story of Munindraji, an Indian teacher who was asked why he meditated. And his response was, so when I walk into the village each morning, I can see the beautiful flowers, the beautiful purple flowers on the side of the road. To live the life fully. So we, practice coming into the body so we can feel this full aliveness. And when I was reflecting on this, I was remembering a story, I hope 
many of you remember because I think it's such a good one to share with our children and our friends. Um, it took place in 2007 in a metro station in Washington, D.C. And uh, during that time, a man with a violin played six Bach pieces, 45 minutes. And during that 45 minutes, oh, there was a middle-aged man who just slowed down a little but then went hurried up to meet his schedule. And um, a young man leaned against the wall to listen to him and for a little bit, but looked at his watch and started to uh, walk again. One three-year-old boy really wanted to stop and listen, but his mother tugged him along, and he tried to come back and listen some more, and she yanked him away. Forty-five minutes, he played continuously, only six people stopped, really listened. And he collected a total of $32. Finished playing, there was silence. Nobody applauded, and I'm going to read the rest. No one knew this, but the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the greatest musicians in the history of the world. He played one of the most intricate pieces ever written with a violin worth $3.5 million. Two days before, he sold at a theater in Boston where the average seat was $100. And this is a true story, and it was kind of a, an experiment in social behavior. But, uh, it was done by the Washington Post to really sense people's priorities. It really affects me to think about that story because every day the mystery is right here in every part of our life, in every moment, in every person when we look into their eyes it's looking back at us, in every turn of the season. So what are we missing out on when we're hurrying along, trying to cross things off the list? What are we missing out on? I mean, are we seeing the gleam in our child's eye? Are we hugging someone and really feeling, wow, this being matters? Do we slow down enough? You know, are we noticing this, this rolling into fall and the beauty of these days and really savoring them? So aliveness is one of the gifts that the body lives in the present moment, it really does. When you come into your body, there might be pain and unpleasantness and it's part of the healing to open and be with that. And there's a tremendous aliveness we reconnect to. The church says the body is a sin. Science says the body is a machine. Advertising says the body is a business. The body says, I am a fiesta, <laughs> said Eduardo Galliano. Okay, that's fruit number one. The second fruit is that we cannot experience living love unless we're awake in our body. You can have thoughts about love. You can have a kind of abstract sense of, oh, yes, I love this person. But to have that warmth, to have that tenderness, to really sense tender space and the boundaries softening so we sense belonging have to be in the body. Here, tr try this for a moment, just closing your eyes for a second. Because this is, what happens is that when our care is visceral, it really ripples out and touches people. Just sense for yourself the difference between knowing you love somebody and looking them in the eye and saying the words with their name, I love you. And you might just breathe into your heart for a few moments, you can feel your heart. And then bring to mind someone who's easy to love, someone who's not so complicated. Imagine looking into that person's eyes, imagine sensing that person and their care for you, so you can kind of see it in their eyes. And just imagine and, and mentally whisper right now, hear the words, and if you are willing to, whisper it even out loud, softly, 
I love you and put the name in. And do it again and again, a few times now, just whispering to the person you love, I love you, in their name. And see if you can arrive in the sincerity where you're speaking your truth from your heart with living heart energy. Just try it. Imagine the person receiving, getting it, feeling good from it. Just imagine the look on that person's face. And they just receive love. And then sense the felt sense of loving become as large as it wants to be in your own body. Just let it fill you. When we love this life, we take care of this life. When we love this body, this being that we call self, we take care of ourselves. When we feel the aliveness in the heart with another, we act on the other's behalf. Gary Lawless writes this, he says, when the animals come to us asking for our help, will we know what they are saying? When the plants speak to us in their delicate, beautiful language, will we be able to answer them? When the planet herself sings to us in our dreams, when the planet herself sings to us in our dreams, will we be able to wake ourselves and act? Okay. A few full breaths and come on back. So the first fruit is aliveness. The second fruit is to be awake in our body so that the love is visceral and so that it can ripple out and touch others. The last fruit is really a realization of truth, that we cannot see the nature of reality if we're off in our ideas about things. It's an experience of knowing that comes from an embodied presence. When Senjo's in her trance, you can feel it. You can feel that there's not a full life going on and you can see that there's not a seeing into the nature of things. When we're controlling our experience, we can't see our experience. This living universe is beyond any idea that represents it. So we come into our body and wake up into a presence that can perceive. We come into a heart that can understand. We come into this understanding that we're not humans on a spiritual path, but that we're spirit awareness waking up through this human incarnation. That's the realization. So let's just, we'll just finish here um, with, a, with a brief meditation and, and close. And this is, rather than putting my words to it, a way that you can explore the, the realizations that come from embodied spirit. The language in the Buddhist tradition is recognizing impermanence, that it's an ever-changing flow recognizing the suffering comes that we, when we try to control things we separate and recognizing that when we're fully here in this body there's no self we can find we belong to the universe so right now as you just sit still for these last few moments you might sense the breath and let your attention relax with the breath so that as the breath comes in, it's like a balloon expanding, just relax open with the breath. And when the breath goes out, dissolve outward, dissolve inward, just let go. So breathing in, opening, relaxing, breathing out, dissolving, letting go.
Let your senses be awake. Where are the sounds around you? And with that same listening, non-interfering, receptive listening, listen to and feel the life that's in this body right this moment. full allowing, just let this life live through you. If there's a place in your body you're aware of tension, you can soften a little, because tightness in the body is a way of resisting the aliveness. So soften and then notice the aliveness that starts flowing. feeling this body as vibrating space and just sense, is there anything that's holding still? Can you find anything in this living body that's holding still? Is there anything that's solid? One of the first great insights when we come fully awake in the body is that it's constant change on a cellular, on a molecular level. We're made of the elements, like the earth. We're made of air, water, fire, changing molecules, moving, a dance. Is there anything that's not moving? just a changing river of sensation, images, sounds, nothing static. And if we keep paying attention, is there any self in this world of sensation, of vibrating space? If you answer with your mind, you'll just say, oh yes, I'm here. But if you feel into the body, is there any self that's there. Self only exists through our thoughts, concepts. Without concepts, just changing sensation. Is there any center to this field of sensation? Is there any boundary? When we really get that it's empty of selfness, of any entity, we can sense that it's just full of awareness. Vibrating space, continuous, filled with the light of awareness. Is anything missing? in these last few moments, just rest in this wakeful presence, sensing continuous space, illuminated with the light of awareness, vibrating space. I'm sensing in the background that pure presence, the stillness, and awakeness that's our formless nature.
the poet Kabir says, inside this clay jug there are canyons and pine mountains and the maker of canyons and pine mountains. The God whom I love is inside. Namaste.